Madison, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him to you. And he is a professional aerospace engineer with over 30 years of experience with the Rolls Royce PLC. And he graduated from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology with bachelor degrees, bachelor degrees in pure and applied physics in 1986, and he an MBA. He has extensive experience in both technical and managerial roles, spending on the entire project lives, cycle from capability, generation, improvement, procuring, service support. Andrew is a member of Rolls Royce Engineering Fellowship, representing the 100 most senior technical specialists accountable for maintaining Rolls Royce at the cutting edge of technology and He's honorary professor at Aston University Business School, a visiting fellow for Granfield University, a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and chartered engineer. Over the last 15 years, Andrew has led the creation and implementation of Rolls Royce differentiating capability in the area of design for service. This capability, which remains largely unique across industry, has supported the transformation of Rolls Royce products to the most reliable in the industry with ever decreasing cost of ownership. Rolls Royce is domain, domain, domain having created the power. So Rolls Royce is a globally acknowledged pioneer and inventor in the complex engineering service domain, having created the power by the hour, by the hour service concept, which is now the standard for the aviation power industry. I mean, there is a lot of history with Mr. Andrew, and it's our pleasure to have him today with the privilege to give us a lecture, his interactive lecture, is a lecture and a scientific game, competitive scientific and I will leave the time for him to explain and to enjoy it. And I will enjoy with you this lecture. And thank you very much for Introduction. I have no idea who you were talking about, but you're going to get a lecture from me now. And I know nothing like as much as the other guy. Um, what I'm going to do is, hopefully this is about two and a half hours-ish, give or take a bit. Depends how fast we go. Um, I'm going to try and talk for considerably less than half of that time. And we're going to spend most of it, ideally, with you having a go at playing a game because it's much easier to learn this stuff if you actually try to do it in practice. Um, so we'll have kind of a bit of an interplay. I'll talk for a bit, explain some stuff, um, and then we'll have successive goes at the game um, and see how well we can do by the end of the session. Um, um, right, so let's start with topic of why design for service. So I know some of you are um, working your way through a module on risk and frankly the only reason we do it is because we're trying to reduce our own risk in the company. Um, so I'll start with some basics about a gas turbine engine. So one of these things that you see hanging under the wing of an aircraft. Um, it has a, a few interesting characteristics. We design each one to last 25 years, so that's our kind of our minimum expectation of how long an individual engine will exist for before we eventually retire it from service and scrap it off. So considerably longer than kind of your average motor vehicle. Um, they can be used for up to 13 hours every day. So that can be, depending on where you're traveling in Japan. 
they almost use them like taxis to go up and down the country and they can do 10 flights a day um, literally just running less than 30 minutes um, in total uh, alternatively we could have a flight that takes off and then travels for 30 hours and just as a single leg halfway around the world and drops people off and what you find is there's a combination of those but you know that in essence they are in operation for a large proportion of every day um, we aim to have significant overhaul events so where we take the engine off the wing and maintain it every three to five years on average that kind of order of magnitude um, in the middle of the thing we have blades which are about a diameter of something like this and they travel around at 13, 14,000 revolutions per minute, or 200 times every second. You've got a blade going around in a big circle. Um, and those blades are about, about the same size as this, and not a lot heavier, until you start rotating them at that speed. And then it's a bit like hanging a lorry or a small train off the end of the blade. It's about the same weight as literally trying to suspend a, um, a, a small steam train. Um, they're also sitting in a very hot environment at the back end. So the gas temperature or the air that's passing over those blades is around about 200 degrees centigrade hotter than the melting temperature that the blades are made from. I just have to think about that. It's like putting a block of ice in the middle of an oven and expecting it to hold up a steam train. So we spend a lot of time and effort learning how to cool those blades down by 400 degrees or so, so that they're only I don't know, a thousand degrees when they're trying to uh, hold up that kind of weight. Um, the temperatures in the middle of the system where we burn the fuel are about half the temperature of the sun. Um, far too hot to put anything in, so you can't actually put any physical probes or, or materials in there to actually do any testing, so we kind of almost have to guess what happens in the middle of an engine, um, or predict it through mathematical codes. Um, and if you happen to be uh, in the military world, uh, we also have issues that um, uh, the pilots, generally speaking, not performing very benign manoeuvres. They tend to either have full throttle or no throttle. Quite often they'd rather like to travel backwards if they could, because it's a way of getting away from people who are chasing you. Um, and they only have, quite often, one engine, so it doesn't work. The pilot really has no option except to pull the handle and uh, eject themselves from the aircraft. So, uh, quite a hard thing to design. The other interesting thing is that we now sell them with long-term maintenance contracts. Um, so pretty much at the point in time where we sell an engine, we will also commit how much it's going to cost to maintain it over the next 25 years. And we will sign a contract with the customer and we will pay all of the bills, Rolls-Royce pays all of the bills for maintenance over that 25 year period. The customer pays us a certain number of dollars for every hour of operation they do. Um, and you get into some interesting scenarios there. So, uh, one of the latest engines we designed, um, I think we intended to sell a thousand engines, that was our business plan. At the point where we sold the 500th engine, so halfway through our total production volume, and we'd signed up long-term service agreements on every single one, we hadn't actually finished designing the engine. Um, it wasn't off the drawing board, we'd never made one, we had no idea how well it was going to work, and we certainly had no idea what it was going to cost to maintain. But we had already committed what the price was for that maintenance activity. So when you get into that kind of world, our ability to design an engine to a target cost of maintenance is all important because we've already decided 
how much revenue we're going to make as an organisation, we know how much we're going to get paid, we just don't know how much it's going to cost to deliver what we've decided we're going to uh, provide to the customer. Um, the kind of nearest equivalent to a jet engine in the kind of car world would be take something as sophisticated as a Ferrari, um, use it as a taxi, so make sure it does 13 hours of operation a day, um, but then guarantee what all of the maintenance costs are going to be. Um, and you'd expect it in 25 years to achieve around about 2 million miles of travel. So for anyone who owns a car, you pretty much recognise that that's a lot of maintenance. You're probably going to need about three or five engines changes in that period of time. And pretty much at the end of 25 years, there won't be a single part on the, on the car which was the original. You will have changed everything, and probably several times in most cases. So the ability to predict that kind of maintenance cost is really quite crucial to our risk management. So um, we work our way through um, this process and what we'll spend the rest of the time doing is taking a step th through that at a time and explaining what we actually do at each part of the, um, of the process landscape. So let's start right at the top. Um, the first and probably the most important step is just making sure that everyone understands what we're actually trying to achieve. So when we design um, a gas turbine engine, we typically have something around 90 to 100 individual design teams, each of them comprised of anywhere from 5 to 10 people, um, all designing different parts of the engine system. And they all have to come together to create a single design that actually works. So it's really important that we take that you know, best part of a thousand individual uh, designers and we make sure that they're all aiming at the same place um, because they've all got to work together ultimately. Um, and we do it by creating something like this, which is just our entire vision for what an engine should be um, all in one place. So we start at the top. So that item right at the here is what we set out to achieve. So we really want to design an engine that is going to do exactly what it's supposed to. So it, it's there to deliver a certain amount of thrust to push a, an aircraft a certain distance and, and burn a certain amount of fuel. So that's our design intent. And we want it to do it every day, 13 hours a day, completely without fail for five years. So there must be no single occasion where it does not do what it's supposed to. Um, so that's our intent. We design something that we know is going to do the job and it will do it every day um, without fail. And that can't be after we've been practicing for a few years of making them. That has to be the very first engine that comes off the production line. It really has to work straight away. And for anyone who's a, an air passenger and travels on aircraft, you can understand why you would want them to work consistently every single day. Because they're kind of important to keep the aircraft in the sky. Um, so the next thing we do is, because of the conditions that we operate the engine at, you know, they are really, really extreme and it is very hard to make things last a long time in that kind of environment. So we include a health monitoring system. So what we really want to know is at any point in time, how healthy is the engine? Because if I want to do any maintenance activity, I really want months of notice. Now I want to be able to tell the airline, in six months time, that engine is going to require some kind of maintenance activity. So now's the time to plan when is the best time to take that aircraft out of service for a few hours so that we can get the engine out? When's the best time to have that engine in an overhaul facility because you've got a spare engine to use on the aircraft once it's, it's away? 
So the ability to have really good health monitoring and understand just when we need to go and do something is really important. Um, and it's also the, the kind of safety net. If something does go wrong with the engine, we really want to know so that we can take the right corrective action. So that could be planning maintenance in a few months' time, it could be limiting the number of flights that that aircraft's allowed to do before it's maintained to a week or two weeks of flying. It could be that we inform the pilot that there is an issue with the engine and they need to take some action in order to, uh, to safeguard the aircraft. Um, and in an extreme case, the engine can decide to shut itself down. If the, the, the leaving it as it is is more dangerous than removing the power and their pilot's ability to have power. So we have to consider all of those things in the process and decide what we're going to monitor, how we're going to monitor it, and, and what we're going to do once we have it. Uh, would anyone like to guess how expensive that is? What kind of price tag would you put on those, one of those? No idea? Try it, please. 500k. In what units? Pounds? Dollars? And around about 15 to 20 million pounds each. Um, so if you happen to have bought one, the only place you really want it to be is hung under the wing of an aircraft where it's going to do the job that you bought it for. If it happens to be parked in an overhaul facility somewhere for a few months, you're not really going to be that happy that your money's sat there doing nothing valuable. So what we try to do is to make sure that as far as possible, anything that can be repaired or maintained whilst the engine is still attached to the aircraft, we do. Um, and because aircraft are meant to be in service and being used, that generally leaves us a small time window, so typically overnight for, the, for most things. So at most six hours, so we kind of aim for how many things is it possible to either replace or repair in a six hour window from when the aircraft stops being used at the end of the day to where it starts being used the following day. And you can get really, really clever at what you can do. So we have robotic snake arms which will go in through a hole that big travel about three metres around the internals of the engine going past all sorts of obstacles and deliver a laser beam to within 0.5 millimetres of location somewhere in the middle of the engine so that we can do some lasering work and, and tidy up any damage that's in there. So really, really complicated engineering just, just to be able to fix things. Then we get around to the far side, um, which is where we're really trying to best way to describe it is we want value for money when we do maintenance. So if I'm going to take an engine out of operation and maintain it, um, I'm really looking to spend the smallest amount of money possible to get back a longest period of operability that I can. So if I overhaul an engine, it's because I want it to work for the next four to five years without any further maintenance. So I have to decide now what work should I do to guarantee that I'm going to get those four or five years? Because if I only do half the work, but then I only get a quarter of the time back, then that's, you know, my investment per hour of use is double. So it's better to spend 10% more on maintenance activity if it gives you 20% more operational time as a result. So we do a lot of that kind of risk management of how much value do I get from every uh, dollar of maintenance um, expenditure. So then we get into the process of um, breaking the requirements down. So that, that chart you've just seen is literally the one that we use internally for defining uh, what our objective is in this, defining an engine. 
but that's not enough to go and have a thousand engineers all run off and design something that works. So we have to go down a few layers and, and start to break out what that really means in terms of what we want. So this is kind of the real first part of the, the risk management process, is making sure we've thought about what all of the risks are that we're trying to address and that we set effective requirements against all of them and make sure that that's cascaded down to everyone who needs to know. Um, and in simple terms, um, Rolls-Royce exists as a business to make money. Um, we have shareholders, they expect us to make a, a return uh, on their investment and we do that um, in the services world quite simply by we offer a service to a customer which is the ability to deliver an engine and the ability to keep that engine operating for them um, and they're prepared to pay us for that so they really get interested in this that's what they want to buy from us they want performance they want reliability they want the engine to be available for them to use and most importantly, they don't want to pay any more than our competitors are charging for the same service. Um, and that last one is entirely dominant. In terms of what does it cost to buy a Rolls-Royce maintenance contract, it's almost entirely dictated by what do our competitors price their maintenance contracts at. And the same is true for them. You know, we have a strong influence on what they can generate as, as revenue. So to a large extent, the value of the service that we provide is a fixed entity and therefore the revenue that we can earn from that is fixed. The other side of the equation is all about the cost. So in providing that service, we have controls over some of the cost elements and we have to drive those down to the point where actually we can make a profit on providing that service. Otherwise, um, as you can imagine, if you get into the, the world where you have already sold more than half of everything you intend to produce in your business case before you know what the answer is, it's very easy to get into a position where what you thought was going to be a profitable product actually turns out to be the product that bankrupts the company. Because if it doesn't make a profit, um, and the vast majority of our revenue actually comes from services. So Rolls-Royce um, is currently about 54% of all of our revenue comes from maintaining engines rather than making engines. So it's the majority proportion of our business is the, is the maintenance side. Um, so the interesting thing in here is the single biggest cost element is this one. It's how much does it cost to do those maintenance activities every three, four, five years. Um, and there are two basic parts of that equation. First of all, the bill is very big. So over 25 years, uh, we're going to maintain the engine probably five times on average. Um, and we are going to spend four times as much maintaining it as we did manufacturing it you know, on day one which makes each of those five events almost as expensive as manufacturing a brand new engine. Not quite as expensive, but almost. Um, so the two big factors that really play a part in the cost are firstly how often there's a big difference between maintaining every three years and maintaining every five years because that's two or three more maintenance events over the 25 year period which is a big, big change in the cost. So the single most important variable is how often do we have to maintain. The second one then is, and when we do that maintenance, what are we actually going to do and how much does it cost us to achieve? So they, those two items kind of dominate the entire uh, process. So, Timing of a break. First round of the game is about 10 minutes. 10 minutes after the 10 minutes, we'll do the break. Okay. 
Right, so what we're going to do now is um, introduce you to the game um, and give you a, a first go through of that. Um, so it's set in the world of washing machines. So does everyone have access to or own a washing machine? So in this world, rather than a domestic machine, so one you would have in your own house, this is set in the world of um, a kind of commercial setup. So the sort of company that, that do the washing for uh, hotels. So they effectively offer a service to another uh, client who comes in and does the washing. And you're all going to, each table will represent a company who designs and manufactures and supports their own design of washing machine offered into those kind of laundrette or commercial uh, washing companies. So what we're going to do is we'll introduce you to the requirements. So what is it that we're actually after from the customer's perspective and from the internal business perspective and then we'll get you to design a washing machine in about six minutes. So first thing I'll do is introduce you to, um, to the customer. Um, so as a customer, I own this laundrette, and the important thing is, it only makes me money when my customers can come in the door and they can use the machines. So the one thing I'm really interested in is those machines have to be available, they have to be operating. Um, and because I don't like breakdowns, I don't like maintenance outages, I'm going to give you all of that problem. So I'm only prepared to buy your machines if you also offer me a maintenance contract where you take all of the risk that it doesn't work. So I'll pay you a fixed price per day of use, but you have to provide all of that maintenance uh, support. And if the machine doesn't work, I'm not paying you. Nice and simple. It's your, your problem. So you have to take the contract in there at that moment. Um, from the company's managing director's perspective, um, customer thinks or tells us that they're only prepared to pay the cheapest price that's being offered by all the competition. We actually know that's not true. Um, they are prepared to pay a little bit more for quality. So whoever provides the best service can expect to get a 10% premium on revenue. Um, whoever offers the worst service, if they want to sell anything, they're going to have to offer a 10% discount. So, Customer satisfaction will influence how much money we make. Um, we are going to sell 200 machines a year. I've told the salesman that's their target. They are going to achieve it because I have a factory that will produce 200 machines a year and assemble them. So we are absolutely going to make that number of machines. Otherwise, I make a loss simply on having a factory full of people that, that is producing it. Um, and I expect you to make money on the aftermarket as well. So when we support them, we are going to make money on that side of things. Okay? And it is a competition. You are four different companies all competing against each other in this marketplace. So that essentially is the set of requirements that we've got. So let me introduce you to Motor and drum, and there's a washer door. And you have 
two choices to make about each of those components. Firstly, which design standard, and there are three in the brochure you can choose from. So which design standard do you want? And who are you going to ask to make it? And there are three um, subcontractors who will manufacture it for you. Um, and they all have different characteristics. Those are independent choices. Any of the manufacturers can make any of the design standards, so they're not linked. Um, and you have three components to worry about, so you've basically got six choices to make. Three design choices, three supply chain choices. Um, and because all design work is done under the constraints of time, you have exactly six minutes to make your choices, starting now. And when you've made the choices, if you can write them along the top line of the, uh, the choices sheet. Anywhere you want them to get to, and they understand what direction to take to do that, is really key to, to managing the risk at the early stage of the project. So, what we'll have to do now is um, have a look and see how you did. So, team, one, two, three, four. Who's in the lead? Who feels they've done a really good job? Anyone confident? Team two. Excellent. And the answer is team four. So, this is the result. Um, the, the good news is washing machines are really, really big business. So if you go to the city of London, there are offices full of analysts and all they do is look at the washing machine industry. And in particular this week, they're all looking at the way you work. So they've done the analysis. They know that you spent a certain amount of money on your development activities. The blue bit is the amount of money that you made actually selling the machines. And the red bit is the amount of money you made on your service contracts. So this is over the first five years of output. And you can see the net result that Team 4 are in the lead, so this indicates your total net profit as a result of working. Team 1 are not far behind. Uh, team 2, highly confident, but unfortunately fourth, and slightly picked by Team 3. Um, the analysts have done the comparison and tried to work out why that's the case. So, team three, um, you have basically designed the cheapest machine of, of anyone. That means you have also set the, the market pricing. So, you are the benchmark that everyone else is being compared to, and therefore you're constraining the revenue that, that they get. Uh, team one, um, despite coming second, you have actually designed the most expensive machine out of everybody. But it's almost working for you, so maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, customer satisfaction, so this determines whether or not you get that 10% bonus in your revenue or you get the 10% uh, the discount on, on what you're earning. So team one, you're the ones getting the bonus. You have the best customer satisfaction levels out there, industry best quality, best square, uh, spare support. Team three, you're paying the price, unfortunately, for being the most disappointing supplier to your customers. Um, and if you need spare parts, please, you're gonna to have to pray for them because they're not gonna be delivered on time. And when we come to the kind of market analyst view of life, their recommendation at the moment is if you don't have shares in Team 4, go and buy them now because they're really doing well. If you've got shares in Team 1, hold on to them. They look good. If you own shares in Team 2, 